Thanks, Michelle. And good to be back here, though I wish that the story would change for once. So for those who were listening to the education minister uh, just previous to um, our streaming, she did announce that Alberta students will be going back in person uh, starting Monday, January the 10th, um, just a few days away. However, the problem is we did not hear any meaningful um, acknowledgement or addressing of how little the government did, um, you know, in other ways to, to mitigate airborne transmission, which um, Dr. Vipon touched on. What I want to do today, because we have the focus, um, you know, of the public discourse, uh, schools are imminently restarting. I really want to reset the narrative um, because listening to, you know, Dr. Henshaw and um, Minister Lagrange over and over again, you kind of forget how much they've eroded um, from what would be a safe, comprehensive package of tools. And so I'm going to take some time and go into just the basic advocacy points. Um, of what we and other advocates have joined in chorus saying we need layers of mitigation. So whenever you're ready, I uh, have some slides here to take everyone through um, what a safe school reopening should look like. And many of these points are upcycled because we keep saying every time schools come back from holiday or from a closure, um, we need comprehensive uh, multi-layered approaches. So next slide. So here, here we are historically, if we want to situate ourselves in the context is this is actually the third school year. Uh, if you remember the very first school year, school closed in March and never opened again for that very first, um, you know, the pandemic started up in 2020 this, in the spring. And then we have, you know, journeyed on this roller coaster of waves. We had uh, the fall wave of 2020, and then we had Alpha in the spring and Delta um, this fall, and now we have Omicron. And what have we learned is that this government has not done enough, and every school closure is the result of unmitigated spread. Uh, next slide. So. We have the tools now, you know, we have navigated many, many months of schools, pandemic, what we need to add to the um, mitigation package. But what I want to reiterate is that Alberta invested among the least for safe school protocols. So when government says we're following in line other provinces, we actually don't measure up um, in terms of proactivity and direct um, funding targeted for protocols for COVID. So these have been bare minimum. And what's actually been happening since the summer of 2021 is we've lost actually some of these default basic measures. So before I go into the list, I think we need to reiterate that this is because of lack of political will. This is not because we don't know what needs to get done but we need centrally funded distribution of safety measures that are universal to all school boards. And the tools have to be layered and multi-pronged. What's happening right now is that we get one measure and we have others taken away. So rapid tests are coming, but now we no longer have access to PCR testing for schools. So how will we get notification? And I'll go into that into a little detail. The other aspect I want to bring up that the government continues to neglect is including the excluded voices. So when schools are delayed, uh, they did have a plan for children with complex needs that access resources at school. They've, they've lost out again on being at the table and being included in these conversations. So now that schools are reopening, we have to address that there are many communities out there that this government has not um, not only not listened to, but have taken resources away from. So this is a, a little overview. Um, next slide, please. 
And again, I want to revisit this idea that we want to operate on what is a Swiss cheese model. And I've been hearing in the discourse that this is kind of getting lost in the public because we're saying, oh, we have new tools now, we have to get rid of the old ones. And that's not the case. What we need is to add each of what's available in terms of measures onto one another. And that helps to cumulatively mitigate the risk especially in schools. And yesterday in our conversation, next slide, Chad, I think what we can reimagine to make it a little more palatable for the public is, you know, maybe we have to readdress this model as layering for the extreme cold, because in Alberta, at least in Edmonton, eh, we are in a deep freeze. So would you go out into the cold, um, say you got a new toque? Uh, okay, it's great that you have a new fluffier toque that's insulated, but are you going to now forego all the other layers uh, that you had on your torso, on your feet, on your hands. No, we need all of these additional layers. And even if one is improved, it doesn't mean that you get to uh, dismiss the other areas because that means pockets where transmission will still happen. Next slide. So here's the list and I try to, you know, be concise and succinct, but because Schools are such dynamic environments and we've neglected them for so long. We do need to look at this at multiple angles. So the number one thing, of course, is limiting community spread. Um, next, testing, tracing, isolating. Third, the environment, the learning environment, the work environment, uh, PPE. Four, it's data transparency. How much do we actually know about what is going to be happening in the schools once they open? Five is more education adjacent, but it's about the human supports, family supports, and also staffing contingency uh, in the school environment. And last, that is perhaps something new that we've added is a vaccination campaign and increasing access. So I will go into these in a bit de more detail now. Next slide. So first we hear over and over again, the CMOH always says when school cases go up that schools reflect community spread. Yes, indeed, that of course is true. You know, schools are the community hubs of um, every community, every neighborhood. That's where children go to congregate to learn. And that's where a lot of the uh, needs that are in the community are met. But we also have not done you know, anything to mitigate community spread before we open schools on Monday. We didn't in, put in, uh, you know, restrictions for large gatherings enough. We are still seeing high community spread. CMOH just said that community transmission rate is the highest it's ever been. So how can you say that schools are just going to reflect community spread and then do nothing about community spread? We, I think, all along should have been prioritizing schools because they are essential and foregoing the non-essentials in other aspects of the community so that children can have their stability, basic needs met at safe schools. That's not the point of contention. It's more what has the government done on the other side of the lever to lower community spread. Next slide. So testing, tracing, and isolating, of course, was a big topic in the summer. And I'm not sure a lot of parents were in the loop about how much the contact tracing was eroded unless you were in one of the schools where you got a notification but it didn't tell you much it just says no one has to isolate you don't know what class it's in you don't know if your child was exposed so what we should be doing now if we are going to make school safe we need the tried and true uh, default protocols of contact tracing uh, reinstating class-wide and school-wide ahs back notification because teachers and admin shouldn't be doing the bulk of this work. They are not public health workers. Uh, notifying close contacts, even just letting the people that were in the closed classrooms know where there was uh, a rapid test uh, positive report, that will help with mitigation and also helping uh, assess the public risk profile. The other side is I think that we do need to continue PCR testing. They need to redeploy um, some resources because we need to put what we have in official documentation. So this will have legal fallouts for parents that need to take time off to, you know, help, help their kids at home while they're isolating and just so many ripple effects of taking away PCR testing that RETs will not replace. Uh, and the data transparency what is one key factor of not being able to track 
outbreaks in schools anymore because it's not open information. Next slide. And now one big piece, of course, I will reiterate is COVID is airborne. And we did see the education minister do a dance, uh, you know, today on the presser that they did what they could by moving some money around. I will be the first, I guess, to debunk that here, that a lot of the capital reserves that school boards had were already drained um, for the re- you know, the refunding or defunding of operations. So in reality, the reserves were not allocated for capital um, and maintenance and infrastructure upgrades. So really that's hand-waving for them to say, we, we told the school boards to do what they had with beans um, and they, the government still has not addressed ventilation, filtration, purification. And we've had other uh, presentations uh, like by Connor Zicky that discusses what we need in terms of the technical upgrades in classrooms. And again, none of that was addressed today at the announcement. That is a huge piece because transmission of COVID in the air occurs when students take off their masks to have lunch, when they have snacks. Uh, you, sometimes you're gonna have sliding off the faces with the young children. And one group that I want to uh, plug here that's been doing some great grassroots work in terms of public education, uh, about air filtration and ventilation in schools is Fresh Air Schools, Alberta. So look them up for more information. Next slide. The other key aspect from a policy angle is that going back to schools, K to three is exempt from masking still, which really negates the whole idea that they're trying to give out these surgical or medical grade masks. When you have an entire sector of elementary schools that are exempt, you will have school board inconsistency. So we had that in the fall, you're still going to have pockets of unmasked children in schools. I'm not really sure how the government would explain this uh, inconsistency because we're, they're just performing right now um, in terms of um, the masking situation. All right, next slide. And I'll just go through, you know, again, the seal and fit of a mask is very important and loosely sealed, even if they call a medical grade mask is not going to mitigate transmission as much as it could be in the classrooms. Um, you know, there's already a lot of data out there and I'm just going to acknowledge briefly that N95s or respirators are an important piece to this puzzle uh, that, this government, again, has not recommended to school boards and provided uh, expertise to guide school board trustees in making these uh, changes. And this needs to be a central distribution of knowledge uh, because downloading the school boards is not going to be helpful. Next slide. And, you know, Dr. Vipon touched on this, but again, every school letter that we've received as SOS has you know, there's a case in the school, but we are mopping the floor. We are wiping the tables and we are here every wave trying to say that the hygiene theater needs to stop and the resources must be redeployed to mitigate airborne transmission. And again, policymakers are very hesitant because it is costly to pivot uh, this narrative, but we will be back at you know, square one if we don't change our ways um, and stop the hygiene theater in the school classrooms. Um, next slide. So again, it's, it's not gonna be easy to know what's going on in schools because the government actually have, they stopped publishing cases uh, or notifying individual cases. They pivot in the, in the fall to outbreaks. And they keep changing the goalposts of what an outbreak is, how many would uh, you know qualify for in school or scenario change. We need information. You know, um, having a black hole of information is going to be problematic and also very concerning because we won't have any accountability as to what is happening on the ground in schools when we reopen. Next slide. And one avenue that 
we also want to advocate for is that when there are scenario changes because of mass spread, which is inevitable in schools that weren't made to be safe, we need the government to step in and provide financial support um, and mental health support for families that have been through this pandemic for 20 plus months. They continue to negate the idea that schools have, you know, these alternative supports, support gaps. And what I think that we really need to push is that put, putting schools online or even going remote learning for a week or two is hard on families because you've taken all of their help away. Uh, even now, employers, I think, are less understanding of the situation. There are no more federal supports, paid leave. We need a consistent, comprehensive approach that addresses this as well, because schools are not standalone islands, um, and families have been left out of a lot of these, you know, um, multifaceted uh, resources. Next. So lastly, I want to say that we should have been taking this time to do a booster drive. We bought a week uh, in the delay. What was the government doing in terms of increasing uptake for children aged 5 to 11 uh, for their first doses or changing the interval if necessary for certain situations? Just something uh, to acknowledge that we have really low intake for children in this province, but also Boosters for education workers, making them accessible. They were not available at schools before the break. Why don't we try that? Why don't we also bring the public libraries in the fold, recreation facilities? Other provinces like Ontario have these, you know, community collaborative uh, projects to roll out vaccines, um, make people know they are safe, make people know that they're important and they're free. We just have not done any of that. We, this province has been extremely behind in terms of awareness. And that is something that we could have been doing with the time that we bought. Next slide. And that's it for me. I know that was lengthy, but I felt like we really needed to paint the picture that the government refuses to acknowledge is that we have all the tools. We've tried door one to keep schools open. We've tried door two, which is close the schools when things get bad. We need to try this time to open safely with all the measures um, and some that I may have even missed from other angles, such as, you know, workplace um, hazards and, you know, um, other community supports that I haven't brought up. But it's time that we try door three and that's to open safely. And unfortunately, I, I, without that, we will be back here with mass school closures, unfortunately, because Omicron will be ripping through the schools without these much needed measures. Thanks. <laughs>